Jonah and Judah. Did anybody come to give him praise today? I said, did anybody come to give him praise today? My Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice.
This is like the third time I think we've done this song. And when we were learning it, God challenged me with a question. The song is called Raise a Hallelujah. And God said, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to raise a hallelujah? Well, at first I gave the obvious answer because I knew he was taking me somewhere. So I said, well, raise means to lift up, lift up my voice, lift up a, up a shout, raise it up to you. And God said, okay, yeah, but when else do you hear the word raise? Raise from the dead. God said everything he created was given a hallelujah to give back to him. But there are some people, even in this room today, your hallelujah has died on the inside. Something you've gone through, something someone said to you, something you did you can't get past, and you feel like your hallelujah is dormant, it's not alive, you can't raise it back. This is your moment to raise it back. You're gonna do it today, right now. And this is all you have to do. Just sing a little louder. 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 Come on, let your enemy hear you. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. We come to raise a little louder. Raise a little louder. Raise a little louder. Raise a little
Is somebody giving praise? Thank you. 
on and lift up a worship in here this morning. Lift up a worship. You're a great and mighty God. Lord, we magnify your name. We glorify your name. We magnify your name. Everybody lift up your voice and say, You said the only time anybody will ever see his glory is when you lift him up. Come on, somebody, magnify him and lift him up. Magnify him and lift him up. Before you're seated, don't sit down yet. All of our young people, come on. Let's put our hands together for, Ju for culture shock. All of our Judah teens. My right, your left, Pastor Isaiah's got a word for you today. Amen. You're going to be blessed and you can be seated in his presence. How many tithers and givers do we have in the building today? I know we've got them watching by way of social media live uh, all over the YouTube and Facebook live and Judah.cc. Uh, we've, got, we've got electronic members that are tied to us throughout the world that consider Judah their home church. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be in a building to get a word from that building. And so we thank God for those that are watching us today. We honor you. We thank God for you. Uh, we, we, we ask that God would bless you where you are. Y'all wouldn't believe how many people outside... Of, of, of the state of Florida are members of Judah tithing to this church watching us right here on this medium it is just a blessing let's one more time let's welcome you're not going to get to hug them so let's really welcome our Judah members we love you we appreciate you we pray for you every day God bless you get your tithe and your offering in your hand you can text to give if you want 
information is behind me and uh, and you can give online download our app as soon as you can and you can be blessed also if you're in this building and you're holding your phone you may as well share this service right now on your Facebook uh, or on your uh, on your uh, Twitter or whatever you have share it it'll be a blessing to somebody else all you got to do is go to Judah's Facebook page and just go down there to the live service and share and it'll be a blessing to somebody else. That's how you get to preach without saying a word. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for all the givers in the house and I ask that you bless them according to your word. And we ask that you increase families, increase the finances of families, bring all that they need and all that they desire. We ask that you give it to them according to your covenant, your promise in Jesus' name. And they said amen and amen. Ushers, you can receive the tithe and the offering today. How many ladies are in the building? How many of you, how many of you will be honest with you today? Don't, don't start out your Sunday by lying. So be honest, say, Pastor Clint, I've not registered. I'm coming, but I haven't even registered yet. Wave at me if you're in this building, ladies. Amen. Well, you better register. Y'all better register. Amen. Uh, I, I know Pastor Kendall was telling me about three weeks ago that she had already surpassed uh, her last uh, covered girl in uh, a registration three or four weeks ago. They surpassed it already. And I know y'all gonna have a good time up in here. And that is, that's happening this Friday, right, Kendall? This coming Friday. Oh. I, tried, I tried everything I could, ladies, to get in here and be involved, and she just kept kicking me out every time. I said, I said, well, I said, we'll come sing for you. We'll, me and, and Brother Seth and Brother Jody will come in here southbound and sing for you. She said, what y'all going to do? Some kind of bluegrass country stuff up on the stage for my covered girl? So I said, well, I, don't wanna, I ain't going to tell you what I told her, but amen. But then I said, I'll come in and try to preach. She said, why don't you just let me do what I do and you do what you do? bothering me about it then you have your Bibles so proud of all of our volunteers that help us on Saturdays we just started this in Orlando of course uh, 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 Miss Vern has been doing it for for years I think in Groveland area and and just it's gone to another level there but we just started uh, here a few weeks ago and we've already given over 250 families their groceries from this location in just the last few times we've done it. I think that's an awesome thing. Amen. Simon, yes, Lord, do you love me? I do. He said, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Rarely do you ever see Jesus ministering where he wasn't feeding somebody. And so we thank God for all of the volunteers that are helping us with that. It's a blessing. Amen. Genesis chapter 1. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Ben. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 25 and 26. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind. Everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. God saw that it was good and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth today i want to speak to you uh, briefly on this subject image is everything just tell somebody next to you say image is everything they didn't look like they cared. Touch somebody in front of you and say, hey, I thought I'd let you know image is everything. It's amazing sometimes that the impact of something can get us to the place where we know what it is the moment we see the image. The moment we see the image, we know what it is. 
I want you to look at a few images on the screen if they have them for me. The first image, I want you to pop it up there. What is that? Kind of looks demonic, don't it? She looks like a, some kind of, you know, something a horoscope would. What is she? Is she a mermaid or something? I don't know. But that's Starbucks. I'd have thought they'd have had a big fat guy up there. You know, hey, who's that? That's Buck. Who is he? He's our star. He drinks all the coffee we make. So that's Buck up there, Starbucks. No, they put that image. But they don't have to put their name anymore. Because all you need to see is the image. The next image up there is... Are you ready for me to stun you? First to third graders in 2019 were, were tested with two images. And that image was more recognizable from 90% of the first to third graders than the image of a cross. Nine out of 10 kids in school said the cross was a plus sign. But they knew exactly what that image was. Next image. Nike. Next image. Uh-huh. Tarjay. Now... Bring that first image up that we saw. When you see this image, what does it mean to you? Coffee, right? So for some, it represents coffee. When I see this image, I travel a lot. When I see this image, it represents lines, waiting. These people right here, that's not like if my daddy was still alive, he'd go, that ain't coffee. And this one he'd say, well, I mean, it ain't real coffee. When you start naming things, you know, haka laka, chaka maka, laka raka, you know, with a, with a squirt of shaka laka baka and put a little shaka la la. I'd never go get somebody a coffee at Starbucks I'd never remember what they asked me to order for them. Have, if you ever go to Starbucks and you order coffee for two or three people, I guarantee you say, "What? Well, no, 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 hold up, just text it to me. So it does, it represents coffee to a lot of people, but to a lot of other people, it represents many other things. The next emblem that I showed you was the emblem of McDonald's. McDonald's, Represent the Big Mac. Right? Y'all remember? Is that McDonald's two all beef patty special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onion, sesame seed bun? That was McDonald's? But see, McDonald's understood that their image did not represent everything about them. So they leave the image, but behind the image, they advertise other things like, whoever thought you could get a barbecue rib sandwich? Now who that likes barbecue? I mean, if you, if you really a barbecue man or woman, I ain't going, all right, Memphis, I heard Memphis over say, preach. I ain't going to McDonald's to get no barbecue. But they made a McRib sandwich. Then they decided they wanted to compete and they made McNuggets. Chicken nuggets. Then they decided we're going to keep competing and they, they decided we're going to start serving breakfast. 
So we're going to have McMuffins. Then that wasn't enough. They, they wanted to really compete with different people. So they came up with the McFlurries. Now they have a whole thing at McDonald's called the McCafe. I ain't lying. The McBakery. I mean, what's next? The McMustang. I don't know. They're going to start. I don't know. Watch this. Nike started out really promoting shoes. Tennis shoes. But Nike knew if we're going to stay in the game, we got to have warm-ups to match the shoes. Then if we're going to stay in the game, we got to have backpacks to match the warm-ups that match the shoes. But if we're going to really stay in the game, we got to create digital watches that match the backpack, that matches the warm-up, that matches the shoes. Then we're going to, if we're going to stay in the game, we, we got to have, we got to have Nike sunglasses that match the watch, that match the backpack, that match the, the warm up, that match the shoes. Now they have hats and they have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Nike has even come out now with its own drink. It's an energy drink from Nike. Target, go to Target, clothes and electronics is what Target built its image on, but no longer. Now you can go get an eye exam at Target. <laughs> what? Yeah, now you, can, now you can go get your drugs at Target. They got a pharmacy at Target. You can go get a vaccination shot at Target. You can go get tested for COVID at Target. What the heck? This is where I bought my 55 inch TV at a better price. Now Targets have food courts. What? Little by little, the image of these companies are expanding themselves. Why? So that the consumer will believe, watch, whatever you need, you can get here. Oh, Y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all ain't hearing me. You, you, you get to McDonald's. Oh, I know you like our hamburgers, but if you, if you need breakfast, you don't have to go anywhere else. If you, if you like chicken, just stay right here with us. If you're a barbecue man, just, just hang out with us. If your kids want to play, you don't have to go to the park. We'll build a park inside of the McDonald's. Slowly but surely, these companies are expanding itself so that the consumer can see them as the total supply. So, some people kind of know where I'm already going, but so image is created so that when you see the sign, it starts telling you psychologically, whatever you need is here. I remember when Sam's first came out. I remember my daddy coming home the first time he ever went to Sam's. It was, for our Sam's was an hour away from our house. It was in Lafayette, Louisiana. We lived in Eunice, so it was way far. My daddy came back. He told, I'll never forget this. He came in and told my mom, he said, Iris, you got to come with me the next time I go to Lafayette. And my mom said, why? He said, there's a place over there called Sam's. He said, I don't know who he is. He said, but let me tell you something. She said, what? He said, they got everything. My mama said, what? He said, everything, anything you want, Sam has it. Now see, here's the deal. My daddy 
didn't really know if Sam's had everything you wanted, but everything he normally needed in his daily life, he saw it at Sam's. He had never seen that before. He'd never seen a place where you could buy frozen food and tires. Clothes and seed. I mean, he saw it all. Image is everything. Image is everything. This week, I was walking through the Millennium Mall. I was actually there to get Kindle something. And I was going through there, and I... I, when I parked, I came in, you know, I come in, I came in right there by that cheesecake factory and I went up the escalators. Well, when I went up the escalators, I went right into uh, H&M because I saw this cool thing in the window. And as I was in H&M, I was walking and I walked by a mirror and I, I had to take a double take. Because when my image hit the mirror, I backed up, I said, I'm not as fat as I thought I was. I look pretty good. I mean, I stood there for a while, you know, admiring myself, my image. I had a, I had a messed up image about myself until I looked in the mirror and said, man, you know what? You're not that bad. Well, I didn't find nothing over there. Of course not. So I go, and I go, I'm, I, I went in every store. I, I walked in Neiman's. And I walked in front of a mirror. I said, what the heck? I gained 13 pounds from H&M to Neiman's. I looked at, what's the problem here? And the lady came over. She said, can I help you? I said, huh, I don't know. I said, look. She said, well, I said, I, I, I was just over there at H and M, whatever it is. I said, I stood in front of a mirror and I said, I thought I looked pretty good. I said, then I come in your daggone store. I look in this mirror and I said, I look terrible. I look like a pig. She said, well, in those lower level stores, they will buy mirrors that are configured to make you look better so that when you put their clothes on, you will subconsciously think their clothes made you look like this because she said very few people look at themselves in the mirror before they put clothes on. They'll go in the dressing room, put the clothes on, and then come look in the mirror. So when they get in the mirror, it's not a true reality of who they are. And they will subconsciously think, man, this H&M stuff, get me four of those. Get me brown. Green. She goes, now what will happen is, she said, that will work for a customer one time. She said, because when they get home and they put it on and get in front of a real mirror, the reality will hit them and they will not be a return shopper because they will realize they got duped by a false image. She said, we would rather you put on the clothes and see exactly how you're going to look so that when you invest in this level of attire, you at least know exactly how you look when you walk out. Because image is everything. You, you, you've got to realize that when God created man, watch me now, the reason he created us in his image is because if he wouldn't have created man in his image, he would have always been nothing but a concept. 
and God needed more than a concept walking the face of the earth reflecting who he was and who he is God creates man in his own image because image is everything in 2005 I got invited to a top producer in the city and in the in the world a music producer to his house when I got there, there was a gentleman, by, uh, there was back in those days, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but there was watches. They were five to $100,000 watches. They were called Jacob watches. And, and, and they, they specialized like, they would be like red, yellow, white with diamond bezels and all kinds. Of, everybody wanted a Jacob watch. Is anybody old enough to know what I'm talking about? Three of us bunch of lying devils. Well, everybody wanted these watches. And so I go to this producer's house. Well, lo and behold, Jacob is at his house. Jacob, the man that actually owned the company and made the watches, he's there. Well, as I'm there, uh, two or three big time artists come to this guy's house to see the presentation he brought so that they may buy diamond necklaces and watches and all this kind of stuff. And I, and I got to talking to him and just me and him just talking and talking and talking. And he told me, he said, yeah, he said, 90% of what you see in those videos, he said, that's borrowed jewelry. He said, they borrow watches and they borrow chains and they borrow things. He said, like, I can't tell you how many video shoots I've gone to with a, with a safe. He goes, I have a safe in my truck. And he said, all my safe. And then the, the director of the video will come back there with the artist and they will pick out what they want. And then they'll go do the video. And then when it's over with, they'll come back and give it to me. And I get the recognition and then people want to buy it because they saw it in the video. But he said, the truth, uh, if the truth be known, these, these singers and these artists, they, re they could never afford my stuff. But he said, they want to portray the image that they are wealthy enough and powerful enough to have all this stuff. Did you know that, that Hollywood's top actresses rarely own the jewelry that they walk a red carpet with? I mean, I'll see these big old diamonds on people while they're going, you know, well, what are you wearing, Vera Wang? <laughs> jewelry by Chopard and this one and that one and all this stuff. But the, the thing is, is their managers are going to have to return it all the next day. But for a moment, I have put in your mind an image of who I am. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they lost God's likeness, but never his image. So Satan throughout time has tried to steal the image of God from man. Anything I can do to damage your image takes a little bit of way from God. So all through time, Satan has tried to rob men of the image of God. In the book of Daniel, the Bible says, y'all right? The Bible says that the king goes into Judah. Y'all better hear me. Because the king wants the best of the best of what God had to offer. So the enemy goes into the land of Judah. Because if I can extract out of God's kingdom people out of Judah, 
I can take out the first level of God's attack and defense for his people because Judah was always first. So they go into the land of Judah and the Bible says that they were instructed by the king. Study it out if you want. Oh, maybe it's up there, I don't know. Uh, Daniel chapter, yeah. Children, this is what the king said. Get children in whom was no blemish, well favored, skillful, had wisdom, cunning, knowledge, understanding of science, such as had ability in them stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans of Babylonia. Next verse. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and wine, which they drank, uh, to, which he drank. So nourishing them three years that at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Ezariah. Watch this. Now watch. Let's take these people, this next generation. I'm going to upset some of you when I tell you this. Most of us in this building are no longer the enemy's target. I used to be. I'm not anymore. The enemy's main target is in that room to our right and in that room to my left. If the enemy can steal the next generation, trust me, he ain't worried about this one. But the responsibility of that generation and the responsibility of that generation will fall on the hands of this generation and God will hold us accountable for it. And most people don't get in a fight that it don't have something to do with them. And that's what's happening with the church. The church doesn't want to fight anymore because it doesn't really have a lot to do with them. But the bottom line is God said, train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. We've got to get back to teaching our kids about the power of the Holy Ghost, about the presence of the Almighty God, about feeling the glory of God in a service and being able to respond according to the glory. Watch. Watch this. The king said, Kendall, watch me, change their clothes. Did you see what he said? He said, give them wine and meat. Watch this, Pastor Ron. God really dealt with me this week about this. He said, that's why Egypt was called bondage, but Babylonia was called captivity. Two different things. Bondage is when they beat you down to the place where you want to find a way to get out. I have heard the cry of my people. Pharaoh, let my people go. Bondage is something you try to escape. But captivity, they can create an environment that you never want to leave. Why? Because I'm captivated. Have you ever heard, man, they were a captive audience? Which means it doesn't mean it was good. It just means they did something that attracted their attention and gave them something that they didn't want to leave without. Captive. But watch this. The king says, take these young men and give them our wine which always in the scripture represents spirit and our meat, which always represents doctrine and our clothes, which always represents authority and power. Let's make them think like us, look like us 
and deep inside start becoming like us. Y'all ain't hearing me. Let's make them take on our image. And before it's over, they will be so confused, they won't even know who they used to be. The church has become so much like the world that now we can't determine what's godly and what's ungodly anymore. We don't know what we're doing anymore or who we are. We think we got to be mo motivational. If you preach and people get offended, oh, you're going to lose a bunch of people. You better come back over here and be a motivational speaker and make everybody feel better and make everybody love everyone. Don't come over here and tell them what they can't do and don't put borders around them. That's bondage. So we do things to keep the audience captivated. And little by little, we transform the image. See, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, God got them out of Egypt, but he had not gotten Egypt out of them. So the first time they had a problem, you know what they did? They created images. Let's build an image that we can worship and dance around and have fun. An image. Watch. Here's how stupid that is. Watch this. They, 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 they build this image because, watch, for 400 years, they didn't go in thinking that. Little by little, time wore them down. And they saw the Egyptians do it. So then they went and did it. Now watch, everybody say they're in the wilderness. They have nothing. They're getting food on a daily basis. Water out of a rock. They re watch this, they recreate God in their minds through an image of a golden calf. Here's my question, what have they gained? And what has changed in their circumstance? But they were convinced that because the image showed up, everything had changed. You do know you can wear a thousand dollar suit and be broke. You do realize you can drive a hundred thousand dollar car, but you, you're one payment away from losing it. You look the part, but you're not the part. These four boys that they got, bring them back up here. Bring those scripture, scripture back up there. Among these were the children, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know who that was? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen, that wasn't their names. That's what the Babylonians gave them. Now watch. They were brought into Egypt as slaves, but they were brought into Babylonia captive. Watch me now. Celebrated. They wasn't given rations. Kings meet. Why? What? Yeah. Silk. But see, you better understand what you're dealing with because image doesn't remove the reality of identity. Because the name Babylon means confusion. I'm teaching today. Say confusion. If we can watch, if we can get them so confused... Let me ask y'all something. Y'all want to be honest with this morning? Don't you find our world in a state right now of total confusion? Have church, don't have church. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Vaccinated, not don't vaccinate. Republican, no. Democrat, no. Independent. Well. This, this group is for you. This group is against you. These people are this. These people are that. Just creating 
confusion. If I can get you confused, but I look like I'm not, you will continually look to me for the answer. I will create an image in front of you so that if you're confused, you're convinced that I'm not. And when you're confused and you're convinced that I'm not, you follow me, not because you believe me, but because you think I know and you don't. Oh, you don't think that's easy? It's amazing to me. I raised kids, and I'd tell my kids. I remember Taylor growing up. Oh, I want to be this. I want to be that. I'd say, well, this is what you need to do. And then you need to do this. I know what I'm talking about. And we'd go sit with somebody from Hollywood or somebody, some big name person, and they'd go, well, what you need to do is you need to do this, this, and this. And it'd be exactly what I said. And they would, and Taylor would go, oh, wow. Wait a minute, say that again. Same thing. One, one time, uh, PJ Morton, y'all know who PJ Morton is? One time PJ called me, he said, hey man, I'm gonna be in Tallahassee. How far is that from you? I said, shoot, that's four hours, man. Coming no four hours. He said, no, come on down, man. Let's hang out. I said, well, can I bring my son with me? Well, I told, I told Taylor and I told a couple other guys, I'm going to see P.J. Martin. Oh, my God. P oh, my Lord. <laughs> P.J. Martin. Oh, he's with Maroon 5. He's this. He's that. He's a producer. He's a songwriter. Yeah. So we get around there. You know what P.J. said? I loved it. P.J. goes, well, I'll just tell you guys something. You, Taylor, your daddy and, and y'all, your pastor, he done forgot more than I'll ever know about this right here. They didn't even want to hear that. They wanted him to pour into him, pour into him, pour into him. I was all right with it. But what, what I realized is, what I realized was, was they were not rejecting me. They were rejecting my image. They only saw me as preacher Clint, as preacher dad. They didn't see me on the TV and on this and on that and on the award shows and all this kind of stuff. They didn't see all that. They were not impressed with the individual or his information. They were impressed with what they thought the individual was. Image. So they changed their names and the king says, watch me now, I'm almost done. The king says, you all right? He says, watch. I am going to create an image in Babel. And when I do, he's talking to musicians. They're out of the tribe of Judah. He says, and when you hear this music, not the music you've been used to at your house, this music, I want you to bow to the image. Bow to it. Because music is the greatest influencer in the world. I talked with an influencer in Houston, Texas when we were there. He's a major influencer in the business community. And you know what he told me? He said, as an influencer, people don't want what I have because I have it. He said, they, no, he said, people don't want what I have because they, they, they want what I have. He says, they want, they want what I have because they want what I've got. Not what, I, what they wanted. They want it because I have it. There's thousands of pairs of jeans. But if you're influenced by one person and she gets on there and says, now these jeans. Oh, that must be what... Influence, and they said, when you hear the music, when you hear the rhythm, when you hear the, it's un, oh, that that that's I'm unsure of that. You know what the world has slowly done? They've slowly confused us with the rhythms of our worship and our praise, and we don't know. 
anymore what's anointed and what's not anointed anymore. We just know we like that. I'm sorry, there's only three of us here. We just know we like that song. So we're not worried about an anointing. I'll go to churches and they'll ask me, do you know this song? We love that song. Do you know this song? We love that song. Do you know this song? I wish they would do more of this group's songs because it's more popular and it brings people in and it does this and it does that. No longer are we in the pursuit of the, of the presence of God where God can transform us in a moment. We have bowed our knee to the image of success. Watch this. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm about to close. You know what Daniel said to the king, Kendall? Daniel said, and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, which that wasn't their names, they said, we ain't eating your doctrine. We ain't drinking your spirit. And we're not putting on your false authority. Now watch what Daniel says. I'm about to go to the house. Daniel says, leave us alone for 10 days. You with me? I'm just me and you, Pastor, uh, uh, Dr. Ron, watch this. Daniel said, Get, put us isolated for 10 days. Y'all go read your Bible. He says, 10 days isolate us. He said, and don't bring us any meat and don't bring us any wine. Bring us vegetables and water. Vegetables and water. And that's what they did every day. They brought them vegetables and water. And Daniel said, and after 10 days, come check us out. That's what happened. That's what happened, Norma. Read it. And the Bible says the king shows up after 10 days. And the Bible says, not me, the Bible says, and Daniel and the three Hebrew friends he had, their countenance was 10 times better than everybody else in Babylon. You know what that tells me, Jody? This is what that tells me. The further they got, y'all ain't hearing me, from the doctrine and the spirit of the Babylon mentality, the further they got, the healthier they became. I wish I had a church up in here. I'm not trying to see how close I can get. I don't care what the CDC says. I don't care what Fox says. I don't care what CNN says. Tell me what God said. Tell me what the book says. Tell me what the Word says. I'm not bowing my knee to that. The further away from the world they got, the healthier they became. Proving that their doctrine and their spirit was, a, was watch, was even a negative influence on their own people. If I checked out somebody's countenance and they quit eating what I was eating for 10 days and it was 10 times better than mine, I'd shift my diet. Not them. You know what they said? If they're not willing to bow and conform to the image, we got to eliminate them. What you going to do, king? I'm going to take you and I'm a, a one, a two, a three. I'm throwing you in the fire. That's what's going to happen to you. Let me tell you all the first stage of the enemy's trick on us is confusion the second stage is conflict if he can't confuse me he'll try to combat me here we go here's the threat here's old Shadrach I don't care watch this you know what the king said where is the God that you have shown me such loyalty to. Where's he at? I don't see him anywhere. Oh, he ain't in the middle of town where everybody just looking and being impressed. Greater is he that is on the inside of me than he that is in the world. Come on, King, you're wasting time. Well, heat it up two more times. Heat it up three more times. 
I don't care how hot you heat it. You still gonna let us throw you in? Yep, I am. Do you know if he's gonna deliver you? Nope, I don't know. But I know this, I know who he is. I know who he told me and I watched him do what he said he would do. And if he brought my mom and daddy out of Egypt, he'll bring me out of Babylon. I'm putting my trust in the Lord. David said it like this, I some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but I, oh Lord, I put my trust. Watch this. So they, they threw him in the fire. Y'all with me? I got 10 more minutes and y'all will have been here a total of an hour and a half. All right, watch, watch. Threw him in the fire. And the king comes and he says, hey, I threw three brothers in there. They wouldn't drink our wine, which is the spirit. They wouldn't eat our meat, which is the doctrine. And they wouldn't wear our clothes, which is the authority and the power and representation of who we are. They would not conform. But for some reason, they won't be consumed. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought if... I thought if I didn't conform. Oh, oh, y'all don't understand what the word consume means. It's 2021. I'm sorry. Canceled. You preaching, Bishop. I'm preaching way better than y'all shouting today. I can tell you that right now. You won't conform. Okay, we'll cancel you. Because most people want you to speak out until you say something they don't agree with. King says, I'm looking in there, and he says, we threw those cats in there seven times hotter than it was, and they are walking free, no longer bound. What does that tell you, Pastor? I'd rather be free in the fire than bound outside of the fire. Oh, good God Almighty, I wish I had some old church folk up in here today. I said, give me my freedom. Even though you put me in the fire, I'd rather be burning on the inside than cold and dry on the out. Yeah, bro, shataka. Watch. What did, what did the wine represent? What did, the, what did the meat represent? What did the clothes represent? Well, watch this. What are they doing in the, in the furnace? You know what walking represents, right? Faith. Didn't y'all see the image? Yeah, but we don't walk by sight. We ain't worried about image. We walk by faith and not by sight. You can put whatever you want in front of me. You can put this percentage, that percentage, this many people died, that many people. I shall not die. I will live because I trust in the word of God. Watch. Watch. Oh, I got seven minutes. Hey, dude. Hey, guys. Yeah, Neb. I'm looking in there. Didn't we throw three in there? Yeah. I see another image. Where is it? It's not in town hall. It's not at the White House. It's not in Washington, D.C. It's not on local television. It's not on your favorite broadcast. I see another image. Where is it, King? He's walking in the fire with them. Watch. 
the children of Israel, the three boys, they were, they looked like Jesus. Listen, they were willing to say, not my will. I don't care what kind of hell I'm about to go through. Not my will, thy will be done. So watch this. When you take on the image of Jesus, he always shows up. Wait, let me come over here to the left side and tell all these folks. I said, the moment you take on the image of Jesus, Jesus shows up right where you are. Jesus won't hesitate to show up. The minute you decide I'm not afraid of anything, the minute you decide I've got authority and power in my hand, the minute you decide the devil is under my feet, the minute you can look the enemy in the eye and say, get thee behind me, Satan, that's when Jesus shows up. I want you to have five, three or four people around you and say, hey, you need the image of God because image, is everything. Hey, Dr. Cannoli. You know what I love about that story? The king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, you know what he told the three Hebrew children? You wouldn't be been to my image and my music. You wouldn't eat my doctrine drink my spirit or wear my authority he said so you know what you three have been delivered into my hands Nebuchadnezzar never realized he was a prophet because the three Hebrew boys didn't get delivered until they got delivered to him. They were bound all the way to the king, but when the king took over, that's when they got delivered. And the king had prophesied it ahead of time. He said, the minute you come in my hands, he said, I'm gonna see it as you being delivered. You need to hear me and hear me well. When we understand that we are God's image, bring back that, 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 that Nike sign for me. Just, it doesn't matter, the Nike sign, whatever. Watch. You know what Nike wants you to know now? You used to see that as just shoes. But the minute you buy into our image and come into the image, you start realizing that that is representing a whole lot of stuff you can't see. Your mind is limited, so you say shoes. You might say warm-ups. You might say hats. But see, as I kept going, I saw people's faces. They have an energy drink. They have watches. They have, they have, they have sleep monitors to wear on your wrist. They have monitors to put on your ankles to tell you, watch this, Nike, if you're walking properly, you start seeing all these things you didn't know they had because this is just representing Nike. This is not Nike. Are y'all with me? This just is representing Nike. When God made us in his image, he didn't make us so we would become little gods on the earth. I'm not a God on the earth. I'm just representing God. And my image will tell people there's more to God than just talking in tongues. There's more to God than just running around the building or bucking and shouting 
or hollering in church because now my actions become the representing of God to how people think about God because I'm the image. Watch. I'm not God. I'm just representing God. Y'all didn't get it. I'm not God. I'm just representing God because image is everything. Somebody might deserve for me to hit them. And people around me might not blame me for hitting them. And some might say, I wish he would hit them. But I'm the representing factor and image of God. Watch. I'm not God. I'm representing God. Somebody on the seventh row said, I got it. I don't know. I'm every day. I have an opportunity of representing. I'm not God, but every day I get an opportunity of representing. Representing, representing. So if you've been a bad image on God, His mercies are new every morning. Tomorrow, you're not God. No, wait. Well, Pastor, you don't know about my past. You're not God. Watch. He said, I'm God, and I. You're not God, so you can change. And tomorrow when you wake up, you can re-present God. Is this all right? You can change your image. What's got into her at work? All of a sudden, she's nice to me. Is she dying? Something wrong with him? What's going on? No, no, no. I've decided to re-present I messed it up in the past, but I'm going to try my best every day to re-present the image of God. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny that when Satan could not steal the image of God because God created us that way, God said, I've got to go back to work if I'm going to win these people back. Why? Why, God? Because my image has fallen short on the earth. What do you have to do, God? I'm going to have to re-present myself. You're going to go down in a chariot of fire, Lord? No. You're going to be taken from the heavens and sat down on a throne of gold by angels? No. What? No, no, I, I got to fix the image of my people. Got to fix it. Because sometimes the image of the church, if you watch Hollywood, it's nothing but scammers or, or country-fied snake handlers. It's never anybody with any sense. And let me tell you how bad it's gotten. We have started duplicating for financial gain. Now you can go on YouTube and, and watch this. Not the world. Christians now gather videos to make fun of churches. Oh, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. How can we make fun of people shouting? How can we make fun of people speaking in tongues to make them look stupid? It's not the world doing it. It's the church doing it. Why? Money. Get on YouTube, get enough views, money. 
What am I doing? Oh, I'm being conformed by the world. I'm, I'm, man, I'm in Babylon now. They're treating me good. Hey, huh. I made these videos and they're all funny about this preacher and that preacher and this woman and her hair falling off while she's shouting. <laughs> it's so funny. It's not funny to me. Are you here? That's somebody's mother. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's father. We've lost the image of God. And we want to be cool and we want to be relevant and we want to be current. And all those things are okay. I'm not telling you to be uncool and uncurrent. I'm just saying this. Don't ever let the image fool you. What you going to do, God? I got to come back down to earth. I'm going to change what they think of me. By how? How are you going to do it? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put flesh over this perfection. I'm going to change what they think of me by becoming like them. says righteousness put on unrighteousness and when they beat him at Calvary they didn't beat him into a nothingness image they, the reason he was unrecognizable is because how would billions of people look like if you put them all in the same head His image was marred because every one of us was put in his image. He looked like humanity forever, past, present, and future. Unrecognizable, willing to be reshaped because image is everything. He said, I will become like you to show you how to become like me. Because if I see that you did it, I know. didn't come to impress with an image. You know how I know it? You know how I know it, Everson? The Bible says, if they would have knew who he was, they would have never crucified him. But because he didn't look like what they thought God should look like, they thought they could do whatever they wanted to him. And he did, they didn't realize they wasn't doing it because they could. They were doing it because he would. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. Why? For one reason. I've got to change the image of the church to look more like me. Why? Image. Is everything. I want to be a vessel you work through. I want to be more like you. Can you lift your hands and say, I, I want to be more like you. Jesus, Come on. 
Come on, if you knew it, lift your voice and sing it one more time. Say ahead of time for all of you that are, have such important places to get to. Um, have you ever met someone that you knew a lot about but you had never seen them before? You had only heard things about them? And when you met them, what you heard didn't add up to what you saw. He said, man, I would have, I never dreamed it would look like that. I've met people before that I've seen on television or whatever, and look at them, man, you wouldn't believe how small they are. Like they're short and, I mean, they, they don't weigh 150 pounds. But on the screen, they look like, I mean, warriors. Why? Imagery. Watch. Watch how God is. Let me help y'all. The greatest depressive thing on the face of the earth is image. That's why people take an average of 200 selfies to pick one. And we don't take them like this. We take them like this. Why? Then, after we take it, uh, then there's. You ready for this? 723 apps of image correction. What? 723 different companies have created image correction. Make my chin shorter. Make my cheekbones higher. Make my belly smaller. Right? Oh, oh, oh. I didn't know that they had a smooth. Oh, yeah, no more, no more, no more of those sun, you know, spots on my face and everything. Yeah. Oh, no, no bags under my eyes. Then you go to be picked up at the airport and a guy goes, man, I, I passed by you 13 times. I never even realized it was you. I kept looking at your picture on the Facebook and then when I saw you right there, look. Hey, it would be funny if it really wasn't so true, all right? We are dying to impress through image. And the kingdom of God is losing the image of God. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Because we want to be what people want us to be rather than who God called us to be. It doesn't excuse us and our behavior to just do whatever we want to do and say, blame it on our how God made me type of thing. But there is going to be some stuff, right? My mama used to say it all the time. I never saw my mama thin ever in my whole life, ever. I don't remember my mother thin. But my mom, my mom would never say she was fat. My, my mom would talk. She goes, yeah, we're big-boned people. 
No, we're fat. Big boned it. My bones aren't bigger than anybody else's. It's the stuff around the bones that have enlarged themselves. Not the bones, Iris, it's the skin. Image, image. They're not gonna like me, image. They're not gonna receive me, image. How do I look? I'm not saying we shouldn't care about how we look, but here's the deal. What if you're beautiful on the outside, ugly on the inside? What good does it do you to go through life because eventually everything drops. Even what you paid for. But I'm going to tell you this. Some people will forget the way you look. No one ever forgets the way you made them feel. Last night a pastor through some relationships of mine. I didn't give, any, give anybody permission. A pastor called me last night and of course it's, I mean it was late in the night. I got my phone hooked up to a speaker in my room because I like that fan noise, you know. But the speaker, when my phone rings, tells me who's calling. It stops the fan and tells me who's calling. So it started telling me who's calling. Well, Kendall's sitting there. She goes, who's that? I go, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to, I don't know. Why are they calling you? You know how women are. You know how your wife is. What? <laughs> right. Pastor so-and-so. Right. No, I'm kidding. She, she was just going like, who would call you at this time of the night? I don't know. Wouldn't stop calling. Finally, she said, well, you may as well answer it. I answered the phone. This man on the other side, end of the phone was in tears. Never met him. He said, you don't know me from nobody. He said, but my wife is on her deathbed. And every day for the last two months, she's had me put your music only in the room. And I begged people and begged people until I got your phone number. And I apologize for calling you like this. But I think this is my last chance. And he said, I've watched what your music, how it makes her, it just, she rises up in faith. He said, and I thought to myself, man, if his music does that to my wife and makes her believe, what would his voice do if she heard him praying for her? He said, Pastor Clint, would you pray for my wife? Well, that'll make you feel about that big if you lay in there with your fat self in bed, you're not asleep. Take time. Jesus never turned anybody away. And so I said, sure, I'll pray for him. I'll pray for her. He said, I'm going to put the phone by her, her head. And last night he put the phone by her head and I heard her on the phone just going, hey, Pastor Clint. And I began to speak faith and healing into that woman's body. I began to speak to her and say, in the name of Jesus, you're going to rise up and walk. You're going to get out of that bed and the devil is a liar. And Kendall was laying there. And when I hung up, she said, do you know that pastor? I said, no. I said, did you hear him on the phone? She said, no, I just heard you hollering and praying. Laying right there, you're just hollering and praying. And this morning I got a text. That gentleman said, for the first time my wife stood on her feet in the last three months, ate breakfast, sat in the chair, 
looked across the room at her husband and said, can you believe Clint Brown called my room last night and prayed for me? You never know how you can shift the image of God in somebody's life in one moment. Oh, not me. Yeah, you. Oh, not little old me. Yeah, little old you. Oh, I can't do it. But yeah, I can. God always picked people that didn't have the image that everybody thought they should have. He didn't pick David's six brothers. He picked the smallest and the sprawniest of all of them. He didn't pick a, a man that looked like Hercules. He picked Samson. If they'd have known what his strength was, they wouldn't have had to figure out what it was, what the mystery was. Why? Image is everything. God said, I'm looking for people nobody else would pick. And I'm going to pick them out. And I'm going to raise them up to be kings, priests. Push five people around you and tell them, say, image is everything. How many believe it today? Amen. Are you glad you came to church today? I'm glad I'm here so I can defend myself. That is a lie. I did not say that. He lies on me all the time just to get a good story. I'm going to tell you what the real truth is. You want it? Because I got the microphone now. Is he out? Where's he at? That phone rang three times. It's 11 something. I mean, who doesn't say? Who's calling you at 11 something at night? I'm not trying to accuse anybody. I said, you need to answer that phone. You're welcome. <laughs> And we agreed, and I'm so, that's, what an amazing story, amen. Isn't God good? God is so good. How many ladies are excited for a Covered Girl 2021? I'm so excited. If you are not registered yet, please go online and register. If you don't, you're going to have to register when you get here, and you're not going to want to do that. But I want to tell you really quickly, um, how many of you saw the shirts in the lobby this morning, the Covered Girl shirts? Do you like them? Yes. All right, so if you are a VIP, your shirt is included with your VIP package. We've already set your shirt aside. It's gonna be in a bag given to you on Friday night. Don't go get your shirt if you're a VIP. If you have already registered, or if you've not registered yet, and you, if you have pre-ordered your shirt online, if you gave us your size, your shirt is set aside. You can pick it up today. And if you have not purchased a shirt or you're not registered at all, you can go and buy a shirt today. Okay, that'll save us because the truth is we do have, um, we're going to pack this room, y'all, with women, and it's going to be awesome, so I don't want everybody having to be stuck waiting in a long, long line, three, four hundred women to get shirts, okay? So you can get your shirt today. How many first-time visitors in the room today? Any first-time visitors to Judah? Well, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're visiting for the very first time, I'm going to be out in the lobby as I always am every Sunday right out here to my right and your left, and I would love if you would come by and say hello. I'd love to meet you and connect with you. Also, um, let's see. Oh, I, I was going to announce again, but he already did. You know, if, if we are feeding over 300 families, you know that's over 1,000 people that we've touched over the last couple of months here. Judah, Judah, reach out. That's so amazing. Thank you to all of you that have contributed toward that and our volunteers. And thank you. Before Friday, let me just say thank you so much to all of my volunteers. We have an amazing team putting everything together for CoverGirl. I absolutely could not do it. It's going to be amazing. So much about it, I don't even have anything to do with. So I'm so proud and so thankful for all of our amazing volunteers. Um, our Connect groups, I know I've already said it. I'm going to say it again. Our Connect groups will be starting up again right after Covered Girl. If you would like to leave a connect group and you haven't or host a connect group you haven't let us know yet please let us know you're running out of time I'm being uh, gracious and lenient to give you a little bit more time but we have some awesome groups you can start to check those out online already this week we have some of them up but they're not all there so you might want to wait a couple weeks but you can check it out because we have some new ones all right that's it everybody's standing on your feet I'm so glad that you're here today love somebody on your way out and we will see you online Tuesday night and ladies I'll see you Friday night Thank you.